Lord, we do once again come to you today rejoicing that we can bow before your throne. Lord, that as we are gathered together here, we know that you are uniquely in our midst. Lord, what a great promise that that is to us. A great assurance and comfort in our service of you. Lord, I pray as well that we will be uh, very aware of your presence, that we'll be obedient to you, that we'll be quick to respond to your word, that, Lord, our lives may be changed by you today. I do pray that our gathering here and our song and our study of your word and our fellowship and in all that we do, I pray that it will exalt you. I pray that you will be using this time in our lives that we may each be made more like Christ. And Lord, we do bow before you today, thanking you again for the many answers to prayer. We know that as we've carried burdens before your throne, that you have, have worked, you've shown your kindness and your goodness, and we pray that you'll continue to do so. You'll continue to show your good hand in our lives. We pray again for those that are uh, physically hurting. Lord, I know there still are many that are not able to join us um, because of the coronavirus, and so we ask that you'll bless them today. Minister to them spiritually that they may, uh, Lord, continue to be growing in you, though they're not able to be with us, that they may, that you may be evidently working in their lives. Lord, strengthen them, protect them physically. And Lord, we pray as, as well for our outreach here in just a couple weeks. We ask that you will bless that. You will give us a good weather for that evening. Lord, that you will bring out people who are, do not normally attend the church. Lord, that you will open doors for us to share the gospel. That souls will be saved. Father, our, our desire with this is to see the lost come to you. So we ask that you'll be working through us. Be working even now in the hearts of those that will come that they'll be, you'll be drawing them to yourself, that they may believe and be saved. And so, Father, we pray in all of these things that your will will be done. And we thank you that we can trust you in all this. Amen.
1 Peter chapter 5, 1 Peter chapter 5, we left off the book of 1 Peter back in May and uh, took a little bit of a, a detour, if you will, or took a, a different route during the course of the summer. And we're going to come back now today to 1 Peter, and we're going to pick up in the fifth chapter and finish out here in the next several weeks. We'll be finishing out uh, the first letter from Peter to the churches in Asia Minor. And I want to begin uh, by reading the first four verses of this fifth chapter. It says, The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you again for your words. Thank you that your word is sufficient for us in all things. We thank you that it teaches us what we ought to do in the church. We thank you that ultimately you are the chief shepherd, that this church is not ours, but it is yours. And you are exercising your gracious care in a way that is, is beyond our understanding. And you're working in us to make us like Christ. And so, Father, teach us and encourage us today through your word. Amen. Last week, when we finished up the Gospel of John, we saw in John 21 the exhortation of Jesus to Peter. And Jesus told Peter, feed my sheep. And apparently Peter took those words to heart because 30 years later he wrote this letter to the churches in Asia Minor and he told the leaders of those churches the same thing. If you remember, I know it's been a little while since we've looked here, but if you remember, Peter was written, 1 Peter was written to a group of churches in the region of modern-day Turkey, basically would be northern Turkey. These churches were facing opposition and persecution at, at some level. Um, they were, it seems that they were being mocked and harassed by their neighbors. They may have lost jobs, have been chased out of town. They may have been beaten for their faith. These Christians were being, we would say it today, they were being marginalized and discriminated against. And in this, they had little to no legal recourse. There was no economic safety net so that if somebody lost their job, they did not have somewhere they could apply to to get uh, any kind of, of extra income or any kind of help with food. They were on their own. And so many in these churches were, were deeply discouraged. They, some were probably destitute. They had suffered loss for their faith in Christ. And Peter has written this letter to those churches to encourage them to remain faithful to the Lord at a time when their faith was despised by the world. He is teaching them how to live holy lives in a world that is hostile to Christ and to Christians. And now at the end of this letter, he gives specific instructions to the pastors of these hurting churches. He tells them, feed the flock of God. There in verse 2, simple instruction, feed the flock of God. He is telling them to shepherd the sheep. Sometime in the middle of the summer, we talked about um, the job of a shepherd in the ancient Middle East. When we went through John 10, we talked about Jesus as the good shepherd. And, and if you remember that, or if you remember anything about shepherding in that era and in that, 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 uh, that place, the shepherd's job was a difficult task. He was responsible for the sheep day and night. He cared for their physical needs. He was the one that led them to good food, to safe water. He protected them from predators. He nursed them when sick. He rescued them from their own folly. 
And day and night, sunshine and rain, good weather and bad, he was responsible for the care of that flock. And if the shepherd shirked his duties, it was the sheep who suffered. And the word for shepherding sheep, it is used in the Bible to describe the role of a church leader. In fact, one of the common titles for a church leader today comes directly from this idea of shepherding sheep. It's a title we use here. It's pastor. It comes directly from a Latin word that means to be a shepherd. So a little Latin lesson for you this morning. If you want to say shepherd in Latin, you say pastor. It's the very word that is translated, that is shepherd in Latin. So what Peter says, he calls these men elders here, But what Peter says to them is to shepherd, to pastor the flock of God. And what I want to do this morning is I want to take a little bit of time to consider the role of a pastor in a local church. And I know this topic can be at times a bit controversial. Because some people have very strong opinions about exactly how a church should be run. And I'm one of them. I have very definite ideas about how a church should be run. But the, in fact, there's, there's one ministry um, that I follow. I, I, they have a lot of really good resources for churches and for pastors. There's excellent ministry. And they're very strong on their particular version of how a church should be run. So much so that they have stated, publicly stated, that if a church does not have a, a board of elders or a group of elders, it is probably not a New Testament church. Now, I disagree very strongly with that, but I would still consider these men to be godly, faithful pastors and elders. And I still appreciate and benefit from their ministry. And and we talk about the question of the pastor's role, and we're trying to think through it. It's made a bit more complicated by the fact that every major denomination has its own unique twist on church government. So that you can go through Lutherans and Methodists and Episcopalians and Presbyterians and every, every branch just about has its own particular spin on it. And then you get to the Baptists and they don't have their own unique spin. They have several that they employ depending upon which church you, you go to. Um, the form of government that we follow here um, is, is a bit unique. I would say it is a, it is a minority form and, and all the options that are out there. It's one that's not found as much as many others. But uh, very quickly, just tell you what we do here. What we employ is what, we, what I call a pastor-led congregationalism. So in this, the way this works, a pastor, me, has broad authority to make decisions for the church and to lead the congregation through the decision-making process. There are some areas defined by scriptures that the congregation has absolutely the final decision-making authority on. So like calling a pastor, appointing deacons, selecting missionaries, receiving or removing members, um, major directional changes in the ministry. And, you know, the church decides on those matters. And the congregation, the church members, also have the authority to hold the pastor accountable for the decisions he makes. So let me give you a quick example of what this looks like here. If we decided that, or if I decided that we needed to switch our Sunday school curriculum, I would not submit the options of curriculums to the church members for a vote. I would talk to the teachers and we would work out what would be best for our needs at that time. And I would make a decision and order the curriculum. Now, let's say in that process, I, take a, I pick a curriculum that uses, and all of its materials is, uses the English Standard Version of the Bible. That is, in the way our Constitution is set up, that is contrary to our Constitution. It requires that all teachers and teachings be done from the King James or New King James. So if I order a curriculum that uses the English Standard Version so that all our teachers are teaching from the English Standard Version, the congregation has the right, and in this case, the responsibility to, at at a meeting, probably the next business meeting, but sometime at a meeting, to require that we pick a different curriculum. 
to say to myself, you should not have picked that. That's contrary to our principles as a church. You need to find something else. And so we, we have a, um, a legitimate accountability to the congregation, or I have a legitimate accountability to the congregation. At the same time, um, I do not bring every decision to the congregation for its approval before making it. That's why we call it a pastor-led congregationalism. Now, I, I tell you that, just kind of, you know, some of where we're coming from and where I'm coming from as we talk about these things. And you may or may not agree with the way the church is governed. You may think there's a much better way um, you may be convinced from scriptures that there's a far better way to do it. But as we talk about these things, there's definitely room for differences of opinions. If you think there's a version of the church government that's better than the one that I prefer, then, you know, I, I'm probably not going to accuse you of being in sin. Probably still going to treat you as a brother and sister in Christ. I... I would not rank church government as one of the most important doctrines in the Bible. It's not something that I was going to put high on the list of things that I feel like I need to teach a new believer. You know, it's, it's, it's an important thing, though. I can't say it is unimportant, because for a church to work well together, its members need to have some basic level of agreement regarding how the church operates. And so, for example, someone who strongly believes that every church should be run by a board of elders is probably going to have a hard time serving in a church that has a single pastor and no plans to establish a board of elders. You know, more times than not, it seems like they would be at odds at some point to, there. And so I don't want to make more of these issues than I should but we can't brush them aside and say, well, they just don't matter either because they do play a big role in what we do together as a church. And we go to scriptures and what the scriptures really tells us, much more than the, you know, the organizational structure, the Bible's not really concerned so much that we have the right flow chart in our organization. Amen. What the Bible teaches us is about the pastor's character, his doctrine, and his responsibilities as a minister. So what it is telling us is what the pastor must do and tells us these things and what he must be so that every church and every Christian may be protected from illegitimate pastors and also will have the right expectations of their pastors. And, and I know, and it, it's, it's a tragedy that many Christians, and probably some here today, have suffered under poor leadership, have suffered under ungodly leadership, men I would call false pastors. And, and the church has suffered greatly because of men who are in the ministry who are in the pastorate, who biblically had no business ever being there. And one of the solutions to the problems of these false pastors is for Christians to know the role and the responsibilities of the pastor. So as we talk about these things, I, I, one of the reasons we, we bring them up is so that you will know, so that you will be able to look at whether it be myself, whether it be somebody on TV or on the radio or on the internet and examine and say, is that a godly pastor? Is that pastor doing what scripture says he needs to be doing? Unfortunately, the minister, ministry of the pastor in America has been greatly abused to satisfy the desires of so many men. Unfortunately, at least the names I am familiar with is popular on television, I would say the vast majority of them are using the pastorate for selfish ends. They are getting rich out of the ministry. They are gratifying. Tragically, many use their authority to gratify their immoral desires. Some view the pastorate as a means to increase their personal power, to become more important. And American churches, just frankly, are plagued 
by these godless pastors who are interested in nothing more than seeing their own desires fulfilled. And we need to know what the pastors to do so that you will be able to discern between godly and ungodly pastors. And let me say one more thing before I get to the text. I know there's a lot of preface material here, but I think there's a lot of necessary things. God did not give a special secret collection of books just for pastors and that nobody but those that go to Bible college have access to. Everything I know about pastoral ministry comes from the Bible. So that you can know everything about it and as much about it as I do. You may know more about it than I do. Because the Bible does not hide the pastor's job description and responsibilities. Instead, the Bible very clearly communicates these things to entire churches. So that, for example, Peter's letter was not written just to a pastor or to a small group of pastors. It is written to a group of churches, covering a pretty substantial territory, actually. And one of the big reasons for this is so the church can hold the pastor responsible or accountable for doing his job. And so as we talk about the role of the pastor as a shepherd, there's this odd paradox because the pastor is also a sheep. He is a Christian and a church member with the same sin nature, failings, weaknesses, quirks, and problems as everyone else. And a pastor that has no accountability is a tragedy in the making. And so just to put a very fine point on this, you need to hear these things so you can know if I'm doing my job. You need to hear these things so you can rightly provoke me to do my job better and so that you can rightly correct me when I'm not doing what I own. We need to know these things because pastors need godly, biblical accountability. And I'm convinced the problems of leadership in churches are directly connected to that lack of accountability of pastors. There is a group of churches that teach, and pastors that teach, that the pastor himself is untouchable. They believe that questioning him or even confronting him is rebellion. And it will bring the questioner under God's judgment. Let me take you to two passages. I want to show you these things. 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy chapter 5. God publicly instructs pastors. And he instructs churches to correct erring pastors. There's no doubt about it. The Bible is plain On this, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 19, it says, Against an elder receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. Them that sin rebuke before all, that others also may fear. The Bible never says, do not rebuke an elder, same thing as a pastor. Nor does it say that all accusations against pastors are evil. Rather, what it does is it gives wise precautions to protect against malicious, false accusations. But it also says that the sinning pastors are to be rebuked publicly. Pastors are not shielded from correction, but rather it seems to me that they are placed on a higher standard so that when they need to be corrected, the correction takes place in public so that others may be warned. It takes place before the church so that other believers may be warned. And then go to Colossians. Colossians chapter 4. In verse 17, Paul is is writing to the church in Colossae. So again, not to an individual. He's writing to the church in Colossae and he tells this church and say to Archippus, Take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord, that thou fulfill it. 
So in Paul's closing remarks to the church in Colossae, he's giving general instructions to the entire church. He's told them, get the letter that I sent to the church in Laodicea. You read it. You send this letter to the church in Laodicea so they can read it. He's doing, giving some greetings to different people and greetings from people. And in the midst of all that, he says, and church, say to Archippus. Now, who is this guy with the awkward name? Piecing together the information that we have from Philemon and from Colossians, it seems that Archippus was the pastor of one of the house churches in the city of Colossae. He is certainly as a man in the ministry, I think a, very, I think a strong case can be made that he is a pastor in Colossae. And so Paul instructed the Colossian church at large to exhort a particular minister basically to do his job. Now, we don't know the background of any of this, and so I, don't, I can't speculate on what prompted this. But what's important is Paul sends a letter to the church, and he tells the church, exhort this pastor to go do the work of the ministry. To, maybe it's to keep doing the work of the ministry, to be faithful in it. The entire church is not a select group. He's not writing this to a, a board of elders or deacons or trustees or some other thing. He's writing this to the church, and he says, church, exhort the pastor. And so we see from these passages that the pastor is not above correction and rebuke, and he is not above exhortation and encouragement. So to say it again, you must know what I am to do so that you can exhort, encourage, correct, and rebuke me as a brother in Christ. And so finally, back to the passage. 1 Peter chapter 5. What he says here, and I'm going to start with verse 2, is feed the flock of God. The responsibility of the pastor is to feed the flock. As I've already said, the word translated feed there is literally shepherd shepherd the flock of God it's a very broad term that encompasses all that a shepherd is responsible to do for the proper care of the sheep and and it's an extensive list but let me give you some highlights from this and the first and and this is one reason the King James translators translated as feed, because the most obvious responsibility is to feed the sheep. We all know food for the believer is the Word of God. Peter says it is like milk for a newborn believer. It, in Hebrews, it, says, it calls it meat for the mature. Ministering the Word of God is one of the most basic and essential tasks of the pastor. I know in my week, probably the single most time-consuming thing I do is prepare to teach and teach. And, and, and it, is, it, it is prioritized, not just because it's the oftentimes the public thing that you know people see that's kind of what we seemingly come to church for it is the it is prioritized because it is explicitly stated in scriptures as a priority for the pastor one of the qualifications for a man that would be a pastor is he must be able to teach if he's not able to, to communicate the word of God, he cannot be a pastor. He may be a phenomenal Christian, but he cannot be a pastor if he cannot teach. His teaching is vital to the role. It is central to it. In fact, it's so important. First Timothy says, uh, in First Timothy, it teaches that a pastor who labored in the word, who teaches exceptionally well, deserves a double salary. I mean, Paul obviously prioritized the importance of the teaching of the Word of God. And this involves, obviously, the public ministry of teaching during the church services, nowadays online, too. It's more than just the, the public ministry. That's the teaching also in small groups, one-on-one, -on -one, all the aspects of, of, of 
relating with individuals in the church and even relating with those outside the church, the pastor needs to be able to communicate the truths of the Word of God. He needs to be able to teach it to others. Pastor is also responsible to guard the flock. Again, we think of a shepherd, at least from our knowledge of David in the Old Testament, we know that shepherding involved protecting the sheep. And that's part of what is, what is involved. A shepherd, a pastor, is to protect the church and its members, primarily from false doctrines and from false teachers. It involves protecting the church from wolves that may attempt to sneak into the flock, masquerading as sheep, but actually looking for what they can devour. It's the pastor's job is to guard the church. You know, so the part of it is saying at times, this is a false doctrine. And, and it, it may necessitate, even depending on the circumstance, it may, may necessitate being, you know, standing up and laying out an error and saying, look, this is, whatever it is, this is popular right now, and this is coming to us, and it's affecting people in the church, and this is wrong. Let me show you why. It may involve pointing at times saying to someone, look, this guy you're reading or following or listening to is a heretic or an apostate. He's a pre preacher of false doctrines. And, and the reason for that is not, and, and it should never be, well, I only want you to listen to me. You can't listen to anybody else but my preaching. And you would be severely malnourished if you did that. But rather to protect you to, from those that are proclaiming false doctrines. And just, and I don't want to belabor this, but just a quick reason why. I, I spend a lot of time studying these things. And you go to a doctor because he spent a whole lot of time studying illnesses. And there's an aspect there in pastoral ministry of saying, what are the false doctrines out there? Where are these things coming from? What are they, what are they teaching? To, to be able, hopefully, to get ahead of them before they ever get to the church and, and be able to identify them and recognize the, the malady that they would be. And to be able to then point out to a congregation or to a member and say, that's, that's false doctrine. This is coming from wherever it may be. And you need to be aware. You need to avoid it. Pastor's job involves shepherding, guarding the flock, and pastor's job involves, this, this shepherding involves watching for the health and welf welfare of the sheep and the flock. So he's on guard against whatever illnesses, spiritual illnesses that may set in. He must give warning to those who may seem to be drifting away. Understanding the spiritual maturity of the church and understanding the spiritual maturity of the individuals in the church so they can actively work to help people grow in obedience and knowledge and love and grace. Part of the task of the pastor, if you will, is to be a chief edifier. Not the only edifier, but to be able to come alongside the, the, the people in the church and say, hey, let me help you grow. I may have to prod you a little bit to help you grow. I may come alongside you and walk with you, help you grow. I may have to get in front and pull a little bit to help grow. But I want to help you grow to be like Christ. And as the pastor does this, verse 2 again, he says, feed the flock of God. He must, the pastor must always remember the church is not his. And sometimes the church needs to be reminded that they're not the pastor's. This is the, the flock of God. The pastor is an under-shepherd. He's not the owner of the church. He's not the owner of the flock. He is not a hireling. Somebody that just runs away whenever things get tough. He is a shepherd who recognizes that he has been appointed by God to care for a flock that is not his own. The other New Testament word is he is a steward. He is one who is managing somebody else's possession. Caring for that which belongs to another. And the wise pastor will never delude himself into thinking the church is his own. The church is God's. 
It's just that simple. It's you are His. And my job is to take whatever authority has been delegated to me by God and to utilize that to serve the church for the increase of the sheep and of the flock as a whole. And everything that has to be done, everything is done, is done under that, um, that authority of God. And one more thing, still in verse 2, feed the flock of God which is among you. The church the pastor cares for is the one that's there. And we live in a world that everybody has access to, you know, ease of travel. Go anywhere in the world, seemingly. We have here, we have an active online ministry. We are trying to increase its usefulness. I participate in a radio ministry that's broadcast across the UP. I participate in an online ministry that's, that reaches people from all around the world. I can actually look and see where people are reading from. And literally people are involved in or reading that website from every continent except in Antarctica. I don't think we've had anybody from there yet. Um, you know, all of the major continents of the world, people are coming to that website and, and are reading it. And I hope are being taught and impacted by it. And so we're looking to reach as broad as we can, but the reality is that I cannot possibly care for somebody in Australia. I cannot possibly shepherd them. Now, shepherding is personal. It's not something you do long distance. It's something you do face to face. And that, by the, again, as an aside here, but... It, one of the problems with staying home, watching church on TV, I know at times we look at that and think, boy, that looks nice, looks convenient. I can sit there in my pajamas and watch a good service, a really great preacher, great music, all of this stuff, and I can be blessed. Problem, though, is that pastor, he's not your pastor. He doesn't know you. He can't sit across and probably won't sit across some table and look you in the eyes and say, how are you doing? He's not going to know if you had a bad week. He's not going to know if there's physically something wrong. He's not going to visit you in the hospital. It's a, pastoring is personal. And the task of the pastor is to pastor those that are there. I don't just mean those that are come to church on Sunday. I understand that. I mean it's a little bit. It's beyond that. But those that are there within His reach. And so, we're going to finish up this passage next week. I won't spend so long on side things next week either. Um, but before we wrap up, I want to ask you to do three things it's for me and for the church. First, most importantly, pray earnestly. For me, I, I'm thrilled. I see the prayer meeting in the morning before the service seems to be growing. And men gather in the library and pray together for the service and for the day. I hope they're praying for me at the same time. Pray for me. Pray for my walk with the Lord, my obedience to Him, my understanding of His Word, my ability to teach it to others. Pray for me to know the individuals of this church, to minister rightly to them. Pray for me. Also, don't elevate me. If things go well in the church, don't blame me. If God blesses, people are saved and added to the church, and praise God. If God's word convicts and encourages and corrects you, then praise God for his work. Because I am so glad this is not my church. I can't tell you how encouraging and comforting that is that I ultimately I'm responsible for my obedience I'm a steward and I've been given an impossible task and if by God's grace through God's power somehow a little bit of that task gets done then praise God because he's the one doing it
Don't ever make this church or any other church about the pastor. It's God's church. Make it about him. And the last thing I would say is be careful to let the word of God shape your understanding about the church. We talk about church government. Let the word of God shape your understanding about the church. It seems that many churches, many Christians bring to church government ideas from, from business, from legislators, from town councils, from American politics, from all kinds of different places. And we need to be very careful that we go to the scriptures and say, now what does scripture show that the church did? How did the church in the Bible operate? And we let that show us how to function as a church. And we be careful that we do not bring in anything that would be contrary to what the scriptures says. We need to be careful not to bring in things just because they work. It's a great reason many times people bring in stuff. This, this worked really good. Well, it might. It might even work really good at that church. But the first question is not, does it work? Is it biblical? Is it in line with what Scripture says? And, and we broaden that principle out, not just about church government, but about church in general about the way we do our services, about the way that we fellowship together, about the importance of church and the need of church, about the relationship of Christians with one another within the church, that we let scriptures shape our understanding, that we go to the word of God and say, what does the Bible tell us about what it means to be a church? And we let that teach us. We let that shape our thinking, not all the popular ideas that are out there, but the word of God because this is God's church. He's given us instructions. He's given us what we need to know. We need to go to the word of God and let him teach us how to be his church.